Good morning, City Hope. It's a pleasure for me to be here with you this morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know, know me, I'm John Fraser, and uh, my wife, Tricia, and my sons, uh, Jonathan and Matthew, are here, and uh, our daughter, Hannah, goes to Houghton College, and uh, we've, uh, we've been coming here uh, periodically when we, when we come home from uh, the mission field in Hungary uh, for, for quite some time now, and in fact, um, I'm sure I say this every time I speak here, but uh, my wife and I were married right here on this spot 27 years ago this month. And uh, so you can congratulate her on putting up with me for this long. <laughs> um, and so, so we do always love uh, coming back here, and I love to be able to, to come up here and um, share with you folks today. And uh, when I first talked to your pastors about the possibility of, of speaking here while, while we were here for the summer, and I heard they were doing a series on Daniel, I said, oh, I have a message on Daniel chapter 7. Well, I didn't consult my notes. It wasn't actually Daniel chapter 7. It was Daniel, Daniel chapter 9. But I'm actually going to talk about Daniel chapter 8 this morning. So I know your little, I know your little paper says Daniel, chapter, Daniel 7 on the top, so you're just going to have to take a little... You know, if you do it right, you can sort of do a little loop around it and make it look like an 8. So... Daniel chapter 8 is what we're going to be looking at this morning, and um, I hope that doesn't make uh, too much of a mess of the series that your pastors had, had planned, but there's still lots of, lots of material in Daniel for, for everybody, so I think, I think we'll be okay. Now, um, besides uh, being a missionary in Hungary, some of you know that I love apologetics. Apologetics is that branch of theology that has to do with uh, defending the truth of Christianity. And in fact, I love it so much, I just finished a PhD in theology and apologetics at Liberty University uh, a few months ago. And uh, so I love the book of Daniel because there's so much apologetic material in here. Now, uh, there, there are all these great stories in Daniel and, uh, and we love to read them, we love to, to, to talk about them, but the really important question that I always want to know is, are these true? Are these stories true? Can we have confidence that this message is true? And uh, so to talk about that, to, to sort of set the stage for that this morning, I want to ask you a question. If somebody comes to you and says, I have a message from God, how do you know if they're telling you the truth? Because there are lots of people who say, I have a message from God. And a lot of those messages contradict other people who also say they have a message from God. So how do we know which message from God is the true message from God? Um, one answer might be, you just kind of rely on your heart. If you, you hear the message and you kind of feel in your heart that this is a true message from God, then that's evidence that it really is a message from God. I don't think that's a good approach myself. For one thing, um, you know, a lot, of people, a lot of people use this approach. For example, Mormons say, well, you can know that the, the Book of Mormon is the Word of God because you'll get a burning in your bosom and you'll just have this sense that this is a message from, that this is the Word of God. And uh, actually, Muslims say something very similar. If you, you read the Quran and you'll just be struck by the beauty and this couldn't possibly be a, a human uh, you know, a book that was produced by a human being because it's so, so beautiful and powerful, and so you can know that it's the Word of God. Well, I've read both the Book of Mormon and the Quran, at least parts, and I've never had that experience. But even if I had had such an experience, I would still not think that that was good evidence that it was a message from God. So what would be good evidence? My contention is that if someone says they have a message from God, we can have confidence in that message if, if the person delivering it can point to accompanying events, which are things that only God can do. Does that make sense? If someone tells me they've got a message from God, then I want to say, prove it. Show me something that only God can do, and then maybe I'll believe you. And when we look at the history of apologetics, 
Christian apologetics. We see that the, main, the two main arguments for the truth of Christianity have been miracles and fulfilled prophecy. And you look at, now there, there are other good apologetic arguments. I think there are other good reasons for believing that the message is true. But historically, the two main arguments have been miracles and fulfilled prophecy. And um, I've, I've preached about both of these. This morning we're going to be talking about fulfilled prophecy. Um, but of course, the primary evidence for the truth of, of the gospel is the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And I believe there are all kinds of good reasons why we can believe that Jesus really did rise from the dead and appeared to many eyewitnesses. But I'm not going to be talking about that this morning. Today I'm going to be talking about Daniel chapter 8, not chapter 7, um, and the evidence from fulfilled prophecy that this message is in fact from God. Now, when I say that the, in the history of the church, these have been the two main arguments, up until modern times, some people have, have kind of started to shy away from uh, miracles and fulfilled prophecy. And that's, I think, largely because uh, modern scientific people reject miracles and fulfilled prophecy out of hand. Well, I don't think they should. I think we can still have good reason to believe that there really are fulfilled prophecies and miracles. So... Um, So when we talk about fulfilled prophecy, there's a couple of things that we need to, to, to talk about first, okay? Because a lot of people talk about predicting the future and, and say that they can predict the future. You've probably read Chinese fortune cookies, okay? Anybody uh, had Chinese fortune cookie recently? I had one that like didn't really crack and so I couldn't really actually eat it. But um, one fortune cookie said, said this, your golden opportunity is coming shortly. Now, what would you think of that if you read that and, and, then, and then the next day, you know, you got this thing in the mail about some great opportunity, like, oh, it's a fulfilled prophecy. No, you wouldn't say that, right? Because it's, it's vague. It's not very impressive as far as, as uh, prophecies go. It could apply to a whole lot of things. And, uh, you know, of course, we, we don't actually think that that would be good evidence of a uh, fulfilled prophecy. So if Old Testament prophecies are like that, then they're not going to be very good evidence. The question then is whether there is good evidence that there are detailed prophecies written hundreds of years in advance that are unexplainable by natural means. So for a prophecy to be good evidence, I have four criteria that it has to meet. First, it has to be made before the event happens. Right? Yeah. It's easy, to, it's easy to, to have a fulfilled prophecy if you predict it afterwards. Yeah, I knew that was going to happen. No, I did. Honest. Okay. Has to be made before the event happens. Um, the event must be something that is not predictable by natural means. Okay, there are some things that we can predict that are going to happen. The sun's going to come up tomorrow morning. Yeah. Um, and it must be something that someone could not bring about the fulfillment on purpose, number three. And number four, it must be specific enough that it's not explainable as coincidence. So not something like your golden opportunity is coming shortly. So in Daniel chapter 8, we read of a vision which Daniel had in verses 1 to 14. I'm not going to take the time to read through those verses. You can, uh, you can look at those uh, on your own, but I'm going to kind of just summarize. Um, in his vision, he sees a ram with two horns which conquered a large territory, which was followed by a goat with a notable horn, which destroyed the ram. And then when the goat became great, its notable horn was broken and replaced by four notable ones. And out of one of these came a little horn which exalted itself as high as the prince of the host and took away the daily sacrifices. Now, in verses 20 to 26, we read an explanation of the vision which was given by the angel Gabriel to Daniel. And I am going to read these verses. So starting Daniel chapter 8, starting at verse 20. As for the ram that you saw with the two horns, these are the kings of Media and Persia, and the goat is the king of Greece. And the great horn between his eyes is the first king. 
as for the horn that was broken, in place of which four others arose, four kingdoms shall arise from his nation, but not with his power. And at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles, shall arise. His power shall be great, but not by his own power. And he shall cause fearful destruction and shall succeed in what he does and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. By his cunning, he shall make deceit prosper under his hand and in his own mind, he shall become great. Without warning, he shall destroy many and he shall even rise up against the prince of princes and he shall be broken, but by no human hand. The vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true, but seal up the vision for it refers to many days from now. Now, the time of the book of Daniel is set in the 6th century BC, okay? 6th century before Christ. And at the time, at, during that time period, when the, when the Medo-Persian Empire was at the height of its power, it was the world's greatest superpower. Greece, on the other hand, was this puny, small, insignificant little nation by comparison. If you look at a map, there's like, make this, so there's like little Greece down here, and then here's the Medo-Persian Empire like this, okay? So Daniel says, this, this vision says that this little, tiny little country is gonna come and destroy this big, huge superpower empire completely. It would be something like if you said some little country in Central America is going to de defeat the United States and take it over completely, wipe it out, and it'll be gone. You go, well, that's nuts. Okay, so this is a good uh, prophecy because it meets the criteria of being something that you can't explain by natural means. Nobody would look at that. Nobody would have looked at the map back then and said, yeah, Greece is obviously going to take over the Medo-Persian Empire, clearly. No, you would have said, well, the Medo-Persian Empire is just going to wipe out every, Greece and anybody else who gets in their way. And of course, history tells us that Alexander the Great came to power as the king of Macedonia at the ripe age of 20, real overachiever, and proceeded to conquer Greece and as the king of Greece, he then undertook the conquest of the Medo-Persian Empire and the rest of the known world before he was 30. Not a bad resume. The rise of the Greeks under Alexander was, was so surprising and remarkable that one Macedonian orator had this to say. Okay, so, so keep in mind, Alexander came from Macedonia originally, uh, he and his father. They conquered Greece. And then he proceeded as the king of Greece, Alexander. I, there's a lot of details about how he ended up as king, not his father, but that, I won't get into all that. But as the king of Greece, he proceeded to wipe out everybody else, including the Medo-Persian Empire and Egyptians and, and, and everybody else, and conquered the known world in a really short time span. Okay? So this is what a... Uh, one Macedonian orator had to say about this after Alexander's conquest. He said, can you imagine that 50 years ago, if some god had foretold the future to the Persians or their king or the Macedonians or their king, that they would have believed that the very name of the Persians would now be lost, who at one time were masters of almost the whole inhabited world, while the Macedonians, whose very name was formerly unknown, would now be masters of it all. Can you imagine if some god had said that? Well, according to Daniel, there was a god who did say that to Daniel. Okay? But this was such an amazing, surprising thing. Nobody could have predicted this or seen this coming. But in fact, God revealed this to Daniel 300 years in advance. And uh, the Jewish historian Josephus records that 
when Alexander entered the land of Judea during his conquest, he was shown the book of Daniel by one of the priests. And he looked at, at Daniel and he said, oh, I guess that's me. And so they recognized that, that he was the person that Daniel's prophecy was about. Now, as for the rest, Alexander died suddenly at the age of 30, and his kingdom was divided among four of his generals, just as Daniel's vision indicated. And out of one of those smaller empires, there arose a ruler by the name of Antiochus IV. Antiochus IV gave himself a title, quite an impressive one, Antiochus Epiphanes, which means God revealed. So Antiochus called himself God revealed. And remember what the prophecy said, or, or God, God manifest, something like that. And remember what Daniel said of the little horn, that he would exalt himself as high as the prince of princes, put an end to the daily sacrifice, and would be broken by no human hand. Antiochus did put an end to the sacrifices in Jerusalem, and Antiochus died suddenly of an illness and a fever that actually is said, said that he went mad. So I don't, I don't think it was COVID, but it was something that he was broken by no human hand. So all of these predictions made by Daniel were fulfilled in very great detail. The details are quite specific. They match up with historical events from world history. The fulfillment could not have been brought about on purpose by anyone. It was not predictable by natural means. So the fourth criteria is really the big one. Were these predictions made before the events that they describe. Well, when critics look at the book of Daniel and they say, when was the book of Daniel written? Remember, Daniel is supposed to have been written by Daniel who lived in the 6th century BC, hundreds of years before all these events took place. What did critics say? They say, oh no, Daniel was written in the 2nd century. Do you know why they say that? Well, because his knowledge of events in the 2nd century are just way too specific and detailed to have been written beforehand. So he must have known those things happened and that's why we have these, these detailed predictions. So they assume that the author of Daniel must have been writing of events which had already taken place. What does the evidence show? Well, first of all, we know that copies of Daniel were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls and some of those copies have been dated to the third century BC. Okay, now remember, when you're talking BC, like third century is before the second century, not like AD where the third century is after. Okay, right, everybody's with me on that? Yeah. So the copies of Daniel that were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls are dated at least prior to the events of Antiochus IV. Uh, not necessarily but prior to Alexander the Great, but prior to Antiochus. So at least that part of it, we have actual copies of Daniel that were written before that. But keep this in mind. In order for Daniel to have been preserved among the sacred writings of the Dead Sea Scrolls, it would have had to have been written much earlier than that and circulated, okay, this was before the printing press, before Kindle, and all of your other stuff that you can get books. You know, I, just to plug my, my book for you for a second, I have a book on Kindle. I just, you know, I wrote it, I, I, I put it, saved it as a PDF file and clicked and boom, it was published. Anybody anywhere in the world could, could get my book. They couldn't do that back then. You know, they had to, everything had to be copied by hand and circulated and so it took a lot of time for something to, to get, to be circulated and let alone accepted as sacred scripture. So it, it would have had to have been written much earlier than that. So we can rule out a second century origin for Daniel. Um, 
Now, we already saw that Josephus refers to Daniel being shown to Alexander the Great when he entered Judea. Elsewhere, Josephus lists the books that the Jews regarded as divinely inspired, one of which was Daniel. And he says that all of these books were written before the reign of Artaxerxes in the fifth century. Now, is it possible that Josephus is wrong? Just consider this scenario here. Okay, just, just let's, let's try a, a little, what we call a thought experiment. Can we do that? Someone writes a bo the book of Daniel in the second century, but they said it in the sixth century. And then they come along and say, hey, guys, look, here's this book that was written in the sixth century that predicted all of these things. And they show it to the leaders of the Jews. And, you know, the Jewish leaders, many of whom were scholars of sacred writings. And here's a book that none of them have ever heard of before. And they're going to believe that it was, in fact, written in the sixth century, even though it wasn't. And they're going to go, oh, wow, cool. Would you believe that if somebody came, uh, came to you with a book and said, hey, this book was written 500 years ago and it predicted, you know, COVID and, you know, whatever else. You could just put whatever you wanted in there. Are you going to say, wow, that's amazing. Let's go tell everybody. I wouldn't do that. But to have it accepted as scripture is frankly impossible to believe. Now, critics, of course, say, well, it's impossible to believe that these prophecies are so accurate if they were written hundreds of years before the events. Is it really? Is it impossible to believe that if God exists and reveals himself to certain people of his choosing that he could tell them the future before it happens in great detail? Of course, that is possible. And in fact, this would be evidence that the message is from God. And by the way, one other problem, uh, apologies if some of you probably like history and some of you probably don't. So uh, I hope you can still get something out of this, even if you don't, but I really like this stuff. But one of the problems with dating Daniel, I mean, another problem besides the ones I've just mentioned, to after the events is the fact that he names Belshazzar as the last king of Babylon. Now, why is that a problem? Well, critics said for a long time, oh, this is just an error. Everybody knows Nabonidus was the last king of Babylon. This, who's Belshazzar? We never even heard of him. Daniel, whoever wrote this book, just made that up. Well, guess what happened? In the 19th century, it came to light that, in fact, Belshazzar had been co-regent with Nabonidus when the events of Daniel took place, and Nabonidus was in exile during part of that time. But what's really interesting is that historians from the second century BC all say that Nabonidus was the last king of Babylon. Nobody says anything about Belshazzar because his reign was so brief and so insignificant that he doesn't even get mentioned in the history books. His name was just forgotten until the 19th century when archaeological discoveries found out that, hey, there was this guy named Belshazzar that was actually the last king of Babylon. So there would have been no way for somebody writing in the second century to know that Belshazzar was the last king of Babylon just by consulting the history books. And again, he couldn't just go on Wikipedia and find out. But if it was written in the 6th century, as it says it was, then we can perfectly understand why the author of Daniel knew that Belshazzar was the last king of Babylon. So, if I had more time, I would also talk about the prophecy of Daniel 9, 24 to 27, uh, which includes the predicting the time when Christ would appear, the fulfilled prophecy of the, the destruction of the second temple, because even if Daniel was written in the second century, there are still other prophecies which, of events which happened after that, which are still predicted in the book of Daniel. 
And you might also find it interesting to know that none other than Sir Isaac Newton, one of the most influential scientists of, uh, of history, devoted years of study to the book of Daniel, and in fact tried to use it to predict the end of the world. I found that to be very interesting when, when I found that out, because when I was in high school, you know, anybody studied Newton's laws in high school? Um, nobody ever said anything about him writing about Daniel, but in fact, he did write Daniel. You can, go on the, you can go on the internet and download a copy of Sir Isaac Newton's book on Daniel. Uh, it's kind of weird. It's hard to read, though, because it's old English, and it's like, what in the world are you talking about? But, um, so what is the point of all this? I want to go back to the question that I asked at the start, which is this. If someone comes to you and says they have a message from God, how do you know if they're telling the truth? My argument is that the message should be accompanied by things, by evidence of things that only God can do. Only God can do miracles. Only God has true knowledge of the future. And today we've talked about one prophecy from Daniel that shows that the message of the book of Daniel is from God, which is part of a larger argument for the truth, not just of Daniel, but, but also the rest of Scripture. There's not time to, to cover all of that today. But I want to close with a passage, with a couple of, of passages from the book of Second Peter. Second Peter 1, 16 to 21. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So this word that we have today, the word of God, this message we can know that it's true, that it is a true message from God. Now, critics, academics will say that Daniel is a cleverly devised myth. Peter says, we weren't following cleverly devised myths. We were, we were there on the mountain. Okay, well, maybe Peter made that up. But I don't think he did. But the message of Daniel, the evidence shows that that was not made up. That was not a cleverly devised myth. That was a prophecy given hundreds of years in advance. An actual prophetic word from God. So this series on Daniel, okay, if I have this right, deals with the question of how we can have an unshakable faith in spite of a world which is being turned upside down. And for me, it starts with knowing that the message that we have received is really from God. That it's not just stories that somebody made up, not cleverly devised myths. And I am convinced that we can know this when we see that it is supported by things that only God can do. God knows the future. Sometimes he reveals it to people. And in the case of Daniel, we see that Daniel was one of those people. So my final word this morning is from the end of 2 Peter where we read this admonition. Take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. So as we live this live out this faith that has been handed down to us, we can do so with the confidence of knowing that this is a message from God and that it is true. All the other messages that say they're from God but sound a lot different, 
and we want to know which one's the, the right one, this is the right one. So I want to leave you with that uh, word of encouragement this morning. Please do remember to pray for us as we uh, return to Hungary. I am flying back to Hungary on Wednesday, and uh, I'm getting ready for us to move into a new house. Um, Tricia and Jonathan are going to be returning on August the 23rd. Uh, Matthew's going to be staying here. We're dropping him off at college, giving him the old... No. Um, so we're going back down to one, one out of three kids, so... Uh, pray for us. It's going to be a lot of changes, and uh, but looking forward to good reports of of Hannah and Matthew at Houghton College, and Matthew starting his uh, his first year of college here. So pray for him. Pray for mom. Pray for mom, and then pray for mom again. <laughs> but um, we also do have prayer cards in the back um, on a table on your way out the door. We have prayer cards that you can take one if you uh, would like to remember to pray for us. And uh, also sign up for our newsletters, electronic newsletters. And sometimes we, sometimes we even send out letters by snail mail. Uh, not very often. But um, if you want to sign up to receive our updates and uh, about our ministry with Teach Beyond in Hungary, we'd be happy to share those with you. So thank you for having me here this morning. And... Uh, God bless you all as you continue to serve the Lord and uh, to follow him.